On the morning of March 25, 2017, Palm Beach 911 Dispatch received a call from a man requesting the police. He was reporting the attack of his 21-year-old best friend and roommate who he had just stabbed 25 times while he claimed he was sleepwalking. Hello, my name is Tasha Nicole and this is my series White Rabbit where we deep dive into anything spooky, odd, or interesting while I apply some special effects makeup. This week's story is about the investigation into the murder of Brooke Preston. As you already heard, the twist to this story is that the admitted attacker's defense was that he was sleepwalking when the crime occurred. Today's makeup is going to be tired or droopy eyes because one thing that is known to trigger sleepwalking is the lack of sleep. Now this makeup look is not my original idea. I got inspired by a look I saw on TikTok. Her name is Brianna Bradley and she posted a really cool tutorial on this look and I thought it would be perfect for today's video. This week's video is a true crime video and it does touch on sensitive topics such as violence towards women. Please, if you are sensitive to that type of content, just join me in another video. Brooke Preston was described as a bubbly, energetic, fun-loving 21-year-old. She grew up with her parents and her two sisters in Wyalusing. I am so sorry if I pronounced that wrong, but I was confident. In Pennsylvania. Brooke was very close to her family, especially her sister Jordan. They were only about two years apart. She loved art, especially painting. I got the chance to see some of her charcoal paintings and they were beautiful. They were really good. She was constantly posting about her family, her sisters, how grateful she was for them. It definitely didn't seem like she took her family for granted at all. Brooke's sister Jordan was definitely her best friend, but they also had a really close bond with one of Brooke's friends named Randy. Randy Herman Jr. to be exact. Brooke had known Randy since she was about 10 years old. It was almost like he was part of their family. Randy was described as a kind, loving, gentle soul. Randy grew up with his mother and his sister. His father wasn't in the picture too much. They were pretty distant. And when Randy was 22 years old, his father allegedly shot and killed his girlfriend at the time after a big fight. It's reported that Randy Sr. then went on the run before taking his life in a pickup truck where he would eventually be found. After his father's death, Randy started working at a meatpacking plant where he said that he went into a really severe depression. There was nothing too red flaggy on Randy's record. He did have a few DUIs. Don't do that. He also had a drug possession charge. I'm not sure what exactly he was holding. Randy was working a dead end job and he was really depressed and struggling with his father's passing when he found out that his good friend Jordan had gotten a job opportunity in Florida. Brooke had also moved out to Florida because she started school at Sarasota College, but then she ended up relocating to Palm Beach so that she could be closer to her sister. It started out as a joke that Randy was going to move to Florida with Brooke and Jordan, but then he got an inheritance from his father and he was actually able to put into motion the move. He got a job with Comcast selling cable out of Walmart and he moved to Florida. After renting a condo for a few months, the three friends finally found a house. They ended up renting a three bedroom house and they did what most young adults do. They partied. House parties, beaches, bowling, family dinners, they did it all together. But there was one person's habit that started to get out of control. And that person was Randy. Randy even stated himself that basically when he wasn't working at Walmart, he was getting wasted every single moment. He was drinking so much that he started to blow through his inheritance money. Now, Randy and Brooke's relationship was described differently by different people. While some people like Randy himself stated that they were more like family, other people thought maybe there was something underlying. A friend of them both stated that he thought that Randy really liked Brooke and that Brooke liked Randy back. In fact, Brooke was actually dating someone named Brian. Her relationship with Brian had really taken off and she even told her mother that she thought he was the one. In 2016, Brooke ended up moving to Buffalo, New York with Brian. They had gotten a cute little place and Brooke got a job. 
Now during this time, Randy was still living with Jordan. But by that time, the whole dynamic of the friendship was kind of different. Jordan was living her life and Randy, who had quit his job at Walmart, was basically just drinking away his inheritance. That brings us to Friday, March 24th, 2017. Brooke caught a flight down to Florida to pack up the rest of her things and to drive her car back up to New York. By this time, she had been living in New York for a few months. Her sister picked her up from the airport and the three old roommates went out and they had a meal together before Jordan had to leave for a flight to Denver. After Jordan left for her flight, Brooke and Randy went and they had a beach day. They drank a little champagne. Well, Brooke had a bit of champagne. Randy, as we all know, is a very heavy drinker, so he consumed quite a bit of alcohol. And there is quite a bit of video evidence that supports that because Randy was very active on social media. If you were following his social media, you could almost see his descent into alcoholism. I don't want to put any words in his mouth because I don't actually think I've heard him flat out say I was an alcoholic. So we'll just say he was a very heavy drinker and that night he was drinking a lot. According to some text messages between Brooke and her friend Kyle, Randy was beyond intoxicated after that beach day. Brooke sent a text message to Kyle asking him to come pick her up and just take her away somewhere. She didn't want to be around Randy because he was belligerent and intoxicated and she just wasn't feeling comfortable. Kyle was pretty close to her already so he stopped by to see what was going on. Now Kyle says that he was let into the house by Randy. He went to the kitchen and Randy just kind of disappeared. Shortly after, Brooke came into the kitchen very visibly upset. She shared with Kyle that she had just caught Randy in her closet naked. And the scariest thing is that when she found him in her closet, he didn't even try to explain himself. He just shh. Mm -mm. Now this incident really freaked her out as it should have so she left with Kyle and she slept at his house that night. The next morning Randy says that he woke up after a long night of drinking obviously and he went to the kitchen to get some water. That's when he saw Brooke packing up the last of her things, he got his water and he went back to bed. After Brooke packed up the last of her things, she left and Randy texted her not that long after she left asking where she was. Brooke told him that she and Kyle were going to breakfast and she invited him out also. Randy basically told her he was still recovering from the night before so he was just gonna stay in bed. But he did ask her to stop by before she went back to New York so that he could say goodbye and he wanted to give her a t-shirt to take back to her boyfriend. Apparently they all had this mutual friend that had passed away and they got these t-shirts in honor of that friend. So Brooke agreed and she can be seen arriving back at the house at 8 35 a.m. from a neighbor's camera. That same morning the Palm Beach Police Department received a call from Randy asking for assistance because in his words someone has been murdered I'm sorry it was me. When officers made it to the scene, they found Brooke Preston's body and she had been stabbed over 25 times. Randy was then taken to the Palm Beach Police Department where he was interviewed. In this interview, Randy was very meek, almost inaudible. He was admitting that he did this, but the only way that he knew he did it was because he was standing over Brooke's body with a knife. Randy said that he did not remember anything after giving Brooke the t-shirt. The officers estimate that the attack on Brooke happened around 8.45 a.m. because a neighbor was walking past around that time and they stated that they thought they heard screams. This was basically right after Brooke arrived. At 8.57 a.m., Randy is seen on a neighbor's camera leaving the house and getting into Brooke's car. This is where he drove to a local park and made that 911 call. It took two years for the trial to begin, at which time Randy pleaded not guilty. It wasn't that he was denying that he killed Brooke. Randy just didn't feel like he was criminally responsible because he was sleepwalking at the time. His defense brought experts to spew all of these sleepwalking facts and Randy had lots of character witnesses. There were even officers that handled Randy at the scene that said he genuinely seemed confused about what happened. When you look at Randy's interrogation and you see this soft, sweet, meek boy, it almost makes you forget that the night before he was hiding in Brooke's closet naked. 
but not quite. Randy's defense did make sure to highlight his drug use and his alcohol problem, which was very obvious because he posted it all over his socials. Experts were really important in this case, and there was one expert specifically that Randy and his defense really depended on during this trial, and his name was Dr. Ewing. Dr. Ewing was there to drive home the scientific study of sleepwalking. He referred to a psychiatrist by the name of Bunkalo, I believe it was, and Bunkalo had done many reviews of sleepwalking cases that ended in homicidal violence. I forgot to insert that this doctor found 13 commonalities with sleepwalking cases that ended in homicidal violence. Number one, arousal soon after sleep onset. Randy said he woke up when Brooke came into the room and he gave her that t-shirt, but that he went right back to bed. Number two, extended period of complex motor behavior. This was the attack in itself. Brooke had been stabbed at least 25 times. This attack started in the bedroom and there was evidence that she was either dragged down the hall or into the hall. Three, the victim is loved by the attacker. Everyone that knew Brooke and Randy said that they were like family. Number four, the victim is not recognized. That's just like general sleepwalker knowledge. Sleepwalkers can't recognize faces. Number five, the attack is followed by confusion. Randy told the officers over and over again that he didn't know what happened, which kind of ties into number six, which is amnesia. Number seven is a history of sleepwalking. There were accounts from many of Randy's family members that Randy was a sleepwalking child. He even once rode his bike to a bar that his mom worked at in the middle of the night. When she saw her son at this bar in the middle of the night, of course she tried to call to him, but she said that she knew Randy was sleepwalking because he had this glazed look over his eyes. Number eight, no attempt to cover up the crime. We all know that Randy called 911 and he even admitted on the call that it was him that did it. Number nine, no motivation. Number 10, extended period of stress. Randy was drinking, doing drugs, trying to deal with the loss of his father. He was no longer working and he was blowing through his inheritance money. Because of his drinking, Randy would sleep during the day and he would be up at night drinking. And this was not just the day before the murders, this was his normal sleeping pattern. Number 12, no history of violence. I already told you that everyone described Randy as a loving, sweet, soft, gentle kid. And number 13 is alcohol use. Surprise, surprise, Randy fit into all 13 of these categories. But the prosecution had their own expert and they basically said that it was impossible that Randy was sleepwalking. Based on the timeline where Brooke was seen entering the house and when Randy was seen leaving the house in Brooke's car, the prosecution estimated how long it would have taken for Brooke and Randy to have had that conversation about her leaving, him giving her the t-shirt. He said that they hugged goodbye and she left. And they came up with the conclusion that Randy would have had five minutes to fall asleep, begin sleepwalking, and attack Brooke. The experts stated that it would take hours to get into the correct brainwave to start sleepwalking. It couldn't be done within minutes. After both sides rested their case, the jury deliberated for about five hours. When they came back with a verdict, Randy Herman Jr. was found guilty of the first degree murder of Brooke Preston, and he was sentenced to life in prison. Thoughts. If I were on this jury, I do believe that I would have found Randy guilty. It's not that I don't believe that it's possible that it could have happened. I just don't believe that that's likely what did happen. He would have had five minutes to fall asleep, start sleepwalking, and attack her. And also the attack started in the bedroom. To me, it seems more likely that after they said goodbye, Brooke was attacked on her way out of the bedroom. What also sealed the deal for me was the incident that happened the night before the attack where he was found in her closet naked. I just can't let that go as a coincidence. And sure, yes, he was drunk and maybe liquor has that effect on some people, but I just don't believe there's enough Hennessy in Atlanta to make me get naked and hide in someone's closet. That's not normal. Let me know what you think in the comments. Do you think justice was served or do you think an innocent person is in prison? I hope you enjoyed my sleepwalking eyes. Please like, comment, subscribe, share with someone, and I will see you next time down another rabbit hole.